Oh, well, hello there, friends and family. I'm so glad you could uh, stop in tonight. And uh, you caught me uh, getting ready to do something. You know, for those of you who follow me on the channel, you'll know that I've had just one cast iron pan for all my life. And I love that cast iron pan. It's an old lodge. And this year, it'll be 41 years old. And if you watched uh, one of my previous videos, you'll know it's a fine cooker. It can even do scrambled eggs. I'm not talking fried eggs. It can do scrambled eggs without sticking. Easy to clean up. And that thing is cooked thousands and thousands of dinners or meals over its lifetime. And I wouldn't take a million dollars for it. And I hope it's going to become a family heirloom. With that said, I got to thinking about that one statement. Family heirloom. Well, I have children and grandson. And I wasn't able to uh, get any of my great-grandmothers, my grandmothers, or even my mother's cookware. Now, I won't go into all that right now for the reasons and whatever, but, you know, there were daughters, there were aunts, uncles, you know, whatever. I was too far down the food chain. But with that said, I was thinking, well, I want to make a difference. I want to make sure each one of my children and my grandson gets something from their old papo. And what better than one of the pans that he cooked up all those good meals throughout their life here at Deep South Bama. So I only had the one. I need to go out and buy another one. And I've done that. And I'm going to buy a third one. Maybe a fourth one. But we're going to be starting out brand new with them. And they're not going to be 41 years old. And I'm going to show you just what it takes to get them ready to not only be a family heirloom, but to be something you'll treasure and enjoy every day in your life in the kitchen. So you all stay here with me right now here on Deep South Bama. So y'all, here is my uh, old 40-plus-year-old. Uh, 10.25 Lodge cast iron. So y'all, let's just start off with my old uh, 10.25, 40 year old, be 41 years old this year, cast iron pan from Lodge. And if you'll watch my video on cooking with and caring for uh, cast iron cookware, cooking scrambled eggs in a 40 year old lodge skillet you understand that this skillet not only will fry an egg without sticking it will also scramble eggs without sticking and you might say well that makes sense it's a uh, 40 something odd years old and it's cooked thousands of meals and I love this old pan I truly do but it's a little bit too large for what I do these days that being said, I used to cook for a family of four, and on occasion, for six to eight people. And it was just fine for that. But now, with just me here, it's way too large, and I tend to cook and fill it up, rather than just cook what I need for just little old me. So, the first criteria in selecting a new pan was, I need a smaller pan. So what I wanted to do was downsize from this pan. So what I was looking at was an 8 inch pan. And something I want to clarify right now when you're looking at the size of pans is pans are measured diagonally across them. And where this one's 10.25 or 10 and a quarter inches from inside wall to inside wall. It's only about nine inches of cooking surface. So bear that in mind when you're looking at a cast iron pan. 
Another thing I want you to understand is a lot of pans have numbers, especially the old Griswold and Wagner pans. They were number sixes, number fours, number eights. Well, let's take a number eight. Number eight pan is actually this pan right here, 10.25. Now, how they all come up with that back in the day, I don't know. You'd think a number eight pan is for an eight inch pan, but it wasn't. But this was the old lodge. And what I wanted to do was try to get a pan similar to this, but in a smaller size. With an eight inch overall diameter, which was going to give me about six inches of cooking surface. So the first thing I did was I looked at Lodge. And I looked through every pan they had. And they've got eight inch pans. But another thing I was wanting, I was wanting an unseasoned pan. Which this one here was unseasoned when I bought it. Forty some odd years ago. Well back then, none of your cast iron cookware was seasoned. Fast forward to now, and for about the past 15, 20 years, virtually 99.99% pans come pre-seasoned. So, that being said, since I couldn't find a lodge that was unseasoned, I took a look at other manufacturers. And I looked and I looked. I spent about eight hours on Amazon. I looked at every manufacturer and type of pan they had. And all of them were pre-seasoned. So what can a man do? I went to Google. And I typed in American made. That was another criteria. I want American made, if at all possible, unseasoned pan. Well, they came up with a lot of uh, manufacturers made in America. But after looking into them, and I looked at all of them, I looked at Fields, Finex, Smithy, Stargazer, I looked at Lancaster, and I looked at Butterpat, which are all your higher end smooth finish pans. And that's another thing. Lodge is not a smooth finish pan. It's got a very grainy, pebbly like surface. Here again, if you'll watch that video on me cooking scrambled eggs in this one, it don't bother this one a bit. But all of them with the exception of Stargazer, were pre-seasoned. Now with Stargazer, you can get one that's either pre-seasoned or bare, as they call it, unseasoned. Of course, it was going to cost me $95, which where an 8-inch lodge pan was only 9 bucks. And that's another thing I want to bring up. Lodge is still the most inexpensive cast iron cookware manufacturer that's made in America. And it's been made in America since 1896 continuously in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. It's 124 years. Where all these others I'm about to name off, such as Fields, Finex, Smithy, Stargazer, Lancaster, and Butterpat, they're fairly new to the game. And they all have a smooth machined or sanded finish which a lot of people say that's exactly what you need but like I say I show you on this pan right here that's not necessarily true and why is that it's all in this right here you'll notice this pan is black it's cold it's the seasoning that's what makes the difference whether it's a grainy finish or smooth finish. Your seasoning is what makes it non-stick. So all that being said, I wanted American made if possible. I want an unseasoned pan. I want a smaller pan. And since I couldn't find that on Amazon, I decided to do a Google search and that's what led me through those that I've already mentioned. And they're more higher end pans. And you take Fields and Finex, Smithy, Stargazer, Lancaster and Butterpat, they're going to cost you something. You take like a Fields, their 8-inch pan was $125. Finex, 
125. Smithy was 100. The Stargazer, even though they didn't have a 8 inch pan, they only have a 10, I think it's a 10.25 pan, it was $95. The Lancaster pan was $149.99 and the Butter Pat was $145. Folks, that's way out of my budget. Maybe y'all can afford it. Now I do understand we're talking about creating a family heirloom here. Now by all means, if you can afford that type of money and the smooth finish means something to you, by all means get you one of them pans. I couldn't justify that kind of cost. So with all that said, let me show you what I picked. So what I picked is right here. And we're going to uncover it now so you'll see it. Yep, this is what we got. Now this is a Victoria pan. Let me bring it up here where y'all can see it. And this is an 8 inch, 20 centimeter skillet. And don't beat me up on this. It's not made in America. Nope, unfortunately it's not. But there were several reasons I went ahead and picked this pan. One of those reasons was it had the least amount of seasoning I could find by the color. If you go look at Lodge pans, they're a real dark black. Where this pan right here, I'm not sure the camera's showing it very well, is a very light gray. So in my mind, knowing what bare cast iron looks like, which is very dull light gray, this pan had the least amount of seasoning on it. And that's what I wanted. Second of all, it was smaller. Third of all, it had this nice, long, tapered handle. See? Now, large skillets all have this little stubby, straight handle. Well, I'll show it to you here again. See it right here? And you can see it's a lot shorter than the one out here on the Victoria. And it's straight. And what has happened over the years is that straight handle bothers my wrist. Especially when I pick it up. It puts my wrist in a bind. And back when I was younger, even though it was awkward, it still didn't bother me. But since I was having to buy a new pan, I wanted to see if I couldn't do a little bit better. And I saw this handle, and you can see the nice curve in it, and it is longer. It's rounder with a smooth edge, where the lodge pan has a very distinct ridge around here. This handle fit my hand a whole lot better made it go easier on my wrist so it had the least amount of seasoning it had a real nice handle on it that was two of the reasons another reason is this pan right here has a limited lifetime warranty all you need to do is have a picture of your receipt or the original copy to get this replaced under warranty. And that's it, folks. Now, granted, this Victoria right here, which I'll say right now, they're not sponsoring this video, nor did they send me this pan. I actually spent my own money, got this off Amazon for $16.99. And you might say, well, that's more than the lodge. Yes, it is. So, that was my reasoning behind it. If I was going to have to buy another pan, I was going to get one that suited me better than the lodge. And I like this handle. I like the way it looked when I saw it on Amazon. 
And I like the way it feels now. Put your thumb right there, pick that thing up. Doesn't put your wrist in a strain. Feels good. It's much larger handle for the size of pan than the lodge. Lifetime warranty, that meant something to me. Even though I know this will last a lifetime and many more lifetimes if it's treated properly. Least amount of seasoning. I even looked at the seasoning. Lodge seasons theirs with a soy based vegetable. Victoria here seasons theirs with a certified organic flaxseed oil. Which, if you watch YouTube or Google it on the internet, that seems to be the current rage. Everybody's all about flaxseed oil now. But we'll talk about that more when we get to the seasoning section of this video. So let's take this cardboard out and take a look at this pan. Now, it too is not a smooth machine surface or sanded surface. Let me bring you down here close where you can take a look at it. See? Maybe you can hear that there. Yep, it's rough. Just like my lodge was the day I bought it. Another thing I liked about this pan is you'll see these four spouts. They're a lot larger than the lodge. Now lodge has them on both ends too. But they're just tiny. And you can pour with lodge. Unless you want it dripping down the sides, it takes forever to empty a large pan without making a mess. I'm hoping this one with the much larger pour spouts will do a lot better. So, if you take a look at this pan real close, and there's no way the camera will show it, there is a slight bit of rust showing on this pan. Right there, up there, where it's got chafed by the cardboard. So the seasoning in this pan is not very thick at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to get this pan ready to go. Like I say, this pan cost me $16.99 on Amazon. I'll, I will put a link to that in the description box below this video. So you can take a look at it too. And decide whether Victoria will be the pan for you. Now you noticed I said it wasn't made in America. Well, it is made in the Americas, being South America. Victoria is made in Colombia. So, at least it's not made in China. And that was something I wanted to avoid at all costs. I didn't want a pan from China. So this one at least is made in the Northern Hemisphere, down in South America, in Colombia. And that was as close as I could get to getting exactly what I thought I wanted. And hopefully, I've made a good decision. So let's get this pan ready to do some cooking. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to give this pan a little scrub and some soap and water. Yep. I said soap and water. Now this is a mild dish detergent in this little uh, dish uh, basin here. We're going to use just a natural scrubbing. Now, I did a lot of research on cast iron pans and I couldn't find not a single manufacturer that said don't use soap and water. Not a single one. We're just going to give it a quick little scrub right there in that soapy water. And then what we're going to do is we're going to give it a quick rinse. Yep. What we've got here is we've got hot water running. It's fairly hot. And we're just going to Rinse it all off really well in that hot water. So it's 
nice and clean. And there we have it. Now, I don't know if you can see this or not. But right there, seasoning's rubbed totally off. So what we gotta do next, as all of y'all know, is we gotta get this on the stove and get it to dry. Let's so come on over with me. Let's get this on the stove. We're gonna take it right on over here. We got a burner already on. We're gonna place it there on the stove. We're gonna set that burner at low. And we're gonna let it completely dry off on a low burner here on the stove top. Once it's all dry, we're gonna come back. We're gonna see how this cooks just like it is right now. Well, we went ahead and put the pan on the stove. We got her all dried up and we got her preheated. And now, y'all, please remember, you got to preheat your pan a little. So what we're going to do now for a baseline, see how well this pan cooks, is we're going to fry an egg in it and see whether it'll stick or not. Now, almost all manufacturers say their pre-seasoned pans come ready to cook let's just get us that butter in there and get her melting we'll get that on melting in that pan and we'll get us an egg just so happens i happen to have one and hopefully we can crack it in there without making too big of a mess We'll just make sure we got that whole bottom coated really, really good. Because I don't have a lot of faith in it being ready to cook straight out of the box. Give her a little crack here on the side. We're going to drop that egg on in there. Hopefully without shell. There we go. Got her on in there. Give her a little seasoning because I don't want to waste that egg. We'll be eating it here. I'm not going to throw away a perfectly good egg. We just got that pan sitting on low right now. And we're going to let that egg firm up some. Before we try to flip it. Now you're watching it just like me. In real time. We'll let that egg white come up and set. Then we're going to try to give it a little gentle flip. Now, y'all, I'm going to show you a little trick I use to making perfect sunny-side-up eggs. Take you a little bit of water, pour on in there, right like that. And then all you do is you take your, put your lid on there if you got one. Of course, I ain't got one to fit this pan. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take a little bit of foil, put it right over, right like that. Because that water is going to steam and start helping to set up the top of that egg. It don't take long. Let's take a look at it. Yep, look at right there. Like I told you. Perfect. Now let's see if it'll release. Oh yeah, look at that thing. We're just going to give it a quick flip, right like that. We ain't going to leave it there long. Because I like to have a little runny yolk. Like I said, I'm not going to waste this egg. This will give us a good bench line how this pan's cooking from the get-go. 
Let's just slap it on this little paper plate right here. Yep, there we go. Now I'm going to bring y'all over and let y'all take a look at this pan. As you can see, it did not stick a bit. Nope, that's not good enough for old Mr. Tom. Because I tell you what, you can pry an egg in one of these without a problem. Part of the reason being, use enough oil or fat, leave it alone, cook it on low and slow, it'll release in a heartbeat. And that's exactly what I did with this pan. Cooked it on the lowest setting, my burner. Now you'll see people use this as an indicator of how non-stick their pans are all over YouTube and on the internet. That don't mean nothing. We're going to take it up a notch and we're going to try to cook the ultimate in this brand new pan. We're going to try to cook some scrambled eggs. So folks, you saw it. That little old pan went ahead and fried an egg without sticking. But like I said, there's, there's a little trick to that. What we're going to do now is we're going to take it up to the ultimate. We're going to see if this little old Victoria pan with no additional seasoning straight from the manufacturer will indeed scramble eggs. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to drop in our veggies. Just like we did with that old large cast iron pan. Yep. And we're going to put just a little bit more additional butter in there. Just to give it a little more fat. Because after frying that egg, we're a little slim. We're going to put in about a quarter of a tablespoon there. And you can see she's plenty hot. We're just going to let these veggies brown up a little bit. As you see. And since I got to eat this, we're not going to let it get them too crisp. We just want to saute them a bit. Keep the crunch, but add a little flavor. Now while these are sitting here sautéing a little bit, let me tell you about the trick about frying an egg. And you'll see all kinds of YouTube channels and manufacturers showing you how you can fry an egg on their pre-seasoned pans. Well, as you saw, I did the same thing on this little Victoria with no additional seasoning. But the trick there is, like I said, low temp. That was very low. Low was sitting on my burner. And most importantly, there was enough fat or oil in that pan to create an, a layer across the surface of that pan. So when I slipped that egg in there, there was enough of that melted butter in there to keep that egg from ever coming in contact with the surface of that pan. And there indeed lies the trick. I can fry an egg on a brand new stainless steel pan, do the same thing, and it won't stick either. But scrambled eggs, that's sort of a whole different animal. As you know, most of us have a non-stick pan just so we can do scrambled eggs without having to make a mess that we got to clean up after ourselves. But now, Got a couple eggs here that we took a fork and beat up. We're just going to pop them on in that pan just like that. Right there we got it. We're going to start letting them set up right now. And here again we got our pan on. On low. And we're not going to do anything with it. We're just going to let it sit there a bit. 
let it start to solidify on the bottom. While we're doing that, I'm going to hit that with just a little bit of basil and a touch of parsley. Add some flavor to it. Yeah, we're testing out this pan seasoning, but we also have to eat these. Well, let's start moving this stuff around. We're just going to gently move it around. Hopefully she ain't going to stick. That'd be the best thing, wouldn't it? So far, it seems to be doing pretty good, doesn't it? But here again, we got that temperature down pretty low there. Now, the reason I say scrambled eggs is the ultimate test is because you're disrupting that surface of fat, i.e. the butter, on the surface of the pan. Unlike a fried egg, you crack it in there on top of your fat or oil and you just leave it alone until the bottom of the egg sets up as much as you want, and then you flip it. But you just can't quite do that with scrambled eggs. You gotta move them around. I'm gonna break them up a little bit there. Let them keep cooking. Start flipping them around a little bit, dry them up some. Yeah, they're still pretty darn loose for a brand new pan, aren't they? We just about got them where we like them. Let them sit there just a couple more seconds. Then we're going to slide them out on a paper plate and see what it looks like. That looks like we got about where we want it. So let's go ahead and get these on out of here and see how well they did. That's a little paper plate right here. We're just going to set that right down here. And we're going to see. Well, for the most part, they came out. But I'm going to show you something. You probably can't see it. Maybe you can, but see right there? We got some sticking. Yep. So, didn't quite do the scrambled eggs without sticking. Did pretty good. If you take a look at most of the pan surface. But the air is over here. And over here, it definitely stuck to the pan. So what's that mean? That means we're going to have to go ahead and clean this pan on up. We're going to have to get it ready for additional seasoning. Well, we enjoyed our scrambled eggs there and unfortunately life and energy levels caught up with us last night. And it's the next day. Well, it's the next morning. And I just wanted to say that, so in case some of y'all noticed. And now we've left that pan sitting on the stove overnight. And that's going to happen in real life. At least for me. I don't know about y'all, but there are times I cook something. It's uh, getting on up in the evening. And by the time I cook it, put it all together and eat it, you just sort of run out of the energy to get it cleaned up. But now, we got to get it cleaned up so we can start seasoning this new pan. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add some water to this pan. Yep, right there. Add some water. We're going to turn the burner on. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring that pan 
with the water in it now up to a boil. And since we were also pretty nasty with making those scrambled eggs, we got scrambled egg remnants all up the sides. So we're going to take that same piece of foil we use and we'll fry it up our egg. We're just going to lay it over the top there. Just like that. So as that water boils, there'll be steam created. And that steam will help loosen what's on the side of that pan. So once it comes up to a boil, we'll come on back and continue on. So y'all, while that pan's coming up to temperature and that water's starting to boil, we're going to talk a little bit about the seasoning process. And indeed, it is a scientific process that takes place. And this is what's wrong with how some people do it. Now you'll see on other videos, and you'll hear that you're baking on a coating on your pan. Well, you can do that. You can bake on coating of oil, and that's fine to some point, but that also makes your seasoning prone to peeling and cracking. And that's a common problem in the seasoning of cast iron pans. If you do enough research, you'll run across that problem many times. And what you want to do is you want to have a temperature and select an oil, both of which are extremely important in the seasoning process, that creates the environment to cause a process called polymerization. Yep, because that's what's going to happen. And what is polymerization? Polymerization is, regardless of which fat or oil you choose, you bring up the temperature to that fat or oil's smoke point and just beyond. And in doing so, you start the polymerization process. And what's that? Well, basically, the oil is starting to carbonize. But in doing so, it changes at the molecular level. And during this process of polymerization and carbonization of the oil, it starts to bond at the molecular level with the cast iron. You're not baking a coating on. You're actually getting the oil to form carbon and to bind with the cast iron at the molecular level. And this ensures that your seasoning will not peel or crack off as you're using your pan. Or you won't have a fear of a problem with cooking acidic foods in it. So, what I have here in front of me and what you've been staring at while I've been chatting about seasoning is a list of oils and fats from Lodge Cast Iron. And I'll include a link to this page for your reference and review. Now, it includes many of the oils commonly used in cooking. Everything from avocado oil, safflower oil, light refined olive oil, rice bran oil, soybean oil, peanut oil, corn oil, sesame oil, sunflower oil, canola oil, grapeseed oil, vegetable oil, extra virgin olive oil, vegetable shortening, coconut oil, and flaxseed oil. Of course, all the rage here of late is flaxseed oil. Now, back in the day, our great-grandmothers, they would have used lard. And the smoke point for lard is 374 degrees. Now, I cook with a lot of butter. And that has a much lower smoke point, 302 degrees. But over time, our great-grandmothers and our grandmothers switched over to shortening, i.e. Crisco, which was the most common used back in the day, and you saw it in all their kitchens. And shortening is hydrolyzed vegetable oil. In other words, it's made into a solid and becomes more shelf-stable. But it has a smoke point of 490 degrees. So in talking about all this, 
Why is it important to know your smoke point of your oil? And you can see here from avocado oil being 520 degrees Fahrenheit all the way down to flaxseed oil being low at 225 degrees Fahrenheit. And why is this smoke point so important? Well, you must achieve the smoke point and a little beyond to start that polymerization process and get your oil, start carbonizing, start changing at a molecular level and bonding with the cast iron. And here again, you can watch a lot of YouTube videos out there and people will be seasoning pans from as low as 300 degrees to as high as 500. And that's all fine and good if you choose the proper oil when you're seasoning. Let's say, let's use fat flaxseed oil. All the rage right now. It has a smoke point of 225 degrees. So you're going to need to get above 225 degrees to get it to where it's at smoke point and start the polymerization process. I'd probably say around 250 would be about right. At which point it's going to bond with the molecules of the cast iron on your pan. So therefore it's not a baked on coating, it's a bonded coating that bonds at the molecular level with the cast iron. So what we're going to be using today is right here. Let me show it to you. What we're going to be using is grapeseed oil. And it has a smoke point of 420 degrees. So once we're ready to get that pan off the stove and get it cleaned up the rest of the way, we're also going to be preheating our oven to 450 degrees. This will ensure that the grapeseed oil not only is at its smoke point, but is past it to start the polymerization process and the carbonization of the grapeseed oil and bonding at a molecular level with the cast iron molecules. So let's check that pan and see if it's come up to a boil yet. So here we are, we'll just whip off the old aluminum cover. Oh yeah, you can see the steam. And it's about to boil. We're just gonna let it start to boil there a little bit stronger. And you see some boiling action going on. Well, let me set you up here. So once you got that water in your pan boiling just like we've done here you're going to take some type of scraper now if you've got a plastic scraper that'll work just fine too i had one but i lost it somewhere so i had to revert back to what my grandmother used she just used her metal spatula and all you're going to do you're not going to bear down you're just going to take that spatula and you can apply a little pressure but you don't want to be digging on the pan, especially once you get it nice and seasoned. You're just going to want to run around there to loosen up any of that that's stuck to the bottom. Just like that. And don't worry about it if you don't get it all off at this point in the stage. It's actually not the scraper doing anything. It's more about the boiling and the formation of bubbles coming up underneath what's stuck to the pan that helps loosen it. Well, as well as the boiling hot water. Now at this point, we're just going to turn it off and let it cool down a bit. Now we're not going to let it cool all the way back to room temperature. We're just going to let it cool down to the point where we can handle it safely. And then we're going to take it over to the sink and finish up getting this pan clean to re-season. So we let that pan cool down a bit and here again we just let it cool down enough to allow us to be able to handle it without burning ourselves. We didn't let it get to warm room temperature 
to get cold. You want to make sure you turn your hot water on. The one thing you don't want to do is hit a hot cast iron pan with cold water. You could possibly warp it or even crack it. Be careful, let the water warm up some as we've just done. And we're just going to go ahead and give it a quick rinse right here with water and our sprayer to just knock loose anything in that pan. And you can see right there, most everything has come off. We got a little bit stuck on the side there, but it's loose. Why? Because we covered it and allowed that steam to help loosen this up some. So we'll turn the water off. And now all we're going to do is we're going to take it and put it in some soapy water. Yep, soapy water. And this is just got mild dishwashing detergent in it. We're going to set it on in there real quickly. We're going to take our little scrubber here and this is natural fiber scrubber it's not real harsh we're just going to take it run it around that pan we're not even scrubbing hard we're just running it around there we're letting it do the work for us Make sure we got it all off there. Give it a little wash down on the outside there. And on our handle. And we're going to give it a quick rinse. Back in that hot water. And we'll check it. Make sure we got everything off of it. And it does appear we got just a little bit left right there on the bottom. Right there. We'll give it a little bit more of a scrub. A little more pressure. Make sure we get all that off. And there we have it. That's all back clean. Didn't take much effort. So now we're going to put it back on the burner and let it heat on back up and dry. So we got it back on the burner there. And we're just going to turn that burner on low. And we're going to let it heat up a bit and dry out. And as soon as it's dry, it's ready to start the seasoning process again. And while it's doing that, we're going to set our oven at 450 degrees. And the reason we're using that temperature is because we're going to be using grapeseed oil. And as you all know, as I showed you, right here on this sheet from Lodge, grapeseed oil has a smoke point of 420. So the 450 is going to ensure that we reach the smoke point and we start the polymerization process of binding the grapeseed oil to the cast iron itself at the molecular level. Most of you know I'm an engineer. And this is all about science. Now we've allowed that pan to totally dry off. We've taken it off the burner, but it's still hot. And you want it to be hot when you start applying your oil. And like I said, today we're going to be seasoning the grapeseed oil. We're going to be using a towel. Hopefully, it's lint free. Now, granted, you could use paper towels. I have. Hasn't caused a problem. But we're going to pour a little oil in there. And what we're going to do. We're going to take that oil, 
And we're going to wipe it around the surface of that pan. Yep. We're going to make sure we get it on all the surfaces. And we just want a very thin coating. We're even going to put some on the outside. And we're going to put some on the handle as well. If you see some lint, like I'm seeing, wipe it away. But make sure your coating is very thin. If you don't do that, and you put it on too thick, you're going to get a real sticky surface see what it looks like now nice smooth and black so what are we going to do next well we're going to stick it in that preheated 450 degree oven so let me open it up and i'll take you with me as we stick it on in there so let's go on over and stick this pan and this nice hot oven and we're going to stick it in upside down and the reason for that is we don't want that oil to accumulate down on the bottom edges around the interior surface of that pan so we got it on in there we're going to close this oven on up and we're going to set us a timer for one hour There we have it. Now, we're going to go watch YouTube while this pan comes up to temp. Now, what's going to happen, and I suggest you turn on your exhaust fan if you have one. If you don't, you might want to open the windows. Because here again, we've got that oven set at 450. The smoke point on that grapeseed oil is 420. So it's definitely going to start smoking. And it's going to start smelling up the house. But like I said, we've got to get to the smoke point and beyond to start that polymerization process, which is going to take that oil from being just baked on to baked in at the molecular level with the cast iron itself. So, we'll leave it in there for an hour. And then we'll come on back. Well, as you can hear, folks, that timer's going off. That pan's been in there for an hour. So we'll shut that timer on off. But I'd like to say something real quick. Here's where my method of seasoning differs so much from everyone else's. You see? I'm not going to turn the oven off right now. And leave the pan in there to cool. Nope. We're going to get that pan on out. Well, let's get it on out of this oven here. And we got to be a little careful and hopefully I won't burn myself since I'm doing it one hand. Ooh, look at that bad boy. Set it right up there while we get this oven back closed up. So we got our oven closed back up. Look how nice and black no stains, no irregularities. That's a fine looking cast iron pan. Now you might be wondering why my method is so much different. Well, I didn't turn that oven off, remember? Nope, sure didn't. Let me get you set back up here so I can chat with you a minute. So as you can see, that pan looks perfect nice and glossy black the oven's still going so let me explain what i mean about my method being different see i'm not going to turn that oven off why well that first coat of seasoning and that isn't enough we need to repeat repeat that and we're going to repeat it at least six times yep at least now, 
Most people say leave your pan in there. Let it cool on down. The oven off. And where mine differs is like my grandmother showed me and taught me. She kept her oven on. And what she would do, would she would allow this pan to cool down for about 10 minutes. That gets it down below the smoke point of the oil. And then what she showed me, you go ahead, apply another thin coat of oil, and place it back in that oven. What that did was, for her, it saved her time, and most importantly, that saved her the money on energy to be reheating that oven every time she wanted to apply some seasoning to her pan. See, back then, money was king. You know, she grew up in the Great Depression. Money was precious. Now that I'm retired, money's pretty precious to me, too. And it may be well to you as well. So what we're going to do is let it cool down for about 10 minutes. We'll reapply a thin coat of grapeseed oil. And we'll get this thing back on in the oven. And we'll start the whole process all over again. Now we've let that pan cool for about 10 minutes. And that's got it well below the smoke point of the grapeseed oil that we'll be using to season it. So all we're going to do again, folks, is we're going to add a little more oil right there to the pan. Just like that. We'll grab this little old pot holder here because the pan's a little toasty. And we're going to take that. And we're going to wipe it again all over that pan. Nice thin layer. And I can't stress that enough. You want it to be nice and thin. And get it all over it. Get it on the outside. Get it on that bottom. Get it on your handle. Get it all over it. Make sure it's nice and thin. It's sort of like oil in a good gun. If I had to relate it to anything. And there we have it. You see some lint. Get that out too. Now what we're going to do. Is we're going to stick it back in the oven again. No reason to preheat it, because it's still set on 450, hot and ready. So I'm just going to set it on back in that oven. And we're going to set that timer again for another hour. So y'all, all I can do is show you and tell you how I do things and how I was taught and what differs from what you may see on the internet but if you've watched the channel watch my cooking videos and see me cooking in my old 40 year old lodge cast iron skillet you'll know that thing is just as non-stick as any non-stick pan you can possibly buy so my methods may not be the same. So the results, that's proof of the pudding, as they say. And something else I'd like to tell you about cast iron cookware. You got to use it, folks. And if you're a little bit leery of using it, afraid things are going to stick to it, and you're going to have to spend a lot of time cleaning it and caring for it. The one thing you can do that'll make it way better or more better as we say in the south is cook meats in it and fry in it as well as bacon in it. let me talk to you about that a second ain't nothing better for it than frying bacon in a cast iron skillet it'll do a world of good to that skillet it'll do a world of good for you and that bacon 
I don't think no other pan fries bacon like cast iron. But that being said, fry. Frying uh, chicken, okra, squash, fish, whatever. That frying, that's going to help that pan out too. And then bacon. And we all know, especially here in the South, you can cook cornbread any way you want to. There ain't nothing like cornbread baked in a cast iron skillet. You grease up that pan, you can grease it up short and lard, or you can use butter like I do. Place it in that nice hot oven. And each time you do these things, you're adding the seasoning of that pan you're adding to that carbon level on that cast iron you're building it up and that's what it takes cast iron takes using and not abusing so I do hope you learned something today folks Hope you got something out of the video today. I know it's a little bit long. And I do know I'll get some comments from folks about the old man talking slow, being boring, what happened. I don't care. I'll deal with that later. I do this for my children, my grandchildren, and all of you out there that follow my channel. And we'll be seasoning this pan for the remainder of today. We'll be doing it at least six times, if not eight. And each time we'll be putting on a very thin coat of that grapeseed oil. Now, like I said, you can use any oil you choose. And that's why knowing the smoke point is very important. Because you'll know what to set your oven to. If you're using flaxseed oil, then you don't need to have your oven at 450 degrees. You can set your oven at 300. You're going to reach the smoke point, And you're going to go beyond. It. And therefore, you're going to start the polymerization process and carbonizing of that oil. Where it's going to bond at the molecular level with your cast iron pan. And if you'll do this, you don't got to worry about peeling. You don't got to worry about flaking or the cracking of your seasoning. So with all that said, folks, once I get this thing done, I'll come back in another video and I'll show you how this pan cooks then. And you can compare it to how it cooked during this video. So friends and family, until I see you on the next video, Y'all take care. Stay safe out there. And God bless each and every one of you. Goodbye for now. I gotta get this going on. It's gonna be a long day of seasoning pans. Right tricks. You know, like always. Tricks. Done curled up and went to sleep again. Oh. Hey, maybe I can get Sammy to help me. Hey y'all. Hey there, Samantha. How you doing? Oh, Mr. Magoo. How you doing there, Mr. Magoo? What you doing there, Mr. Magoo? You got your little white socks on and everything. Hey, I need some help, guys. Can y'all help me come on in the kitchen there and help me season cast iron pan? What do you think there, Mr. Magoo? Could you help me out some? Hmm, not too interested, huh? Sure you don't want to help Papa? Well, I'll leave you all to eat. I guess I can get her done by myself. If you all need anything, just scratch on the screen door.
later, I'll 